Hi there, I'm Jim Kudelka, living here in Portland, Oregon. I'm an artist, a working artist here, and a member of the Oregon Potters Association. A little bit about my background. I've always had an affinity towards working with my hands, building models as a kid, gardening, making contraptions, and somehow that led me to a degree in art. I have a BFA degree from Ohio University. I have a master's of fine arts degree from Indiana University. Um, besides my passion of making, I also have a passion to teach and I taught at Oregon College of Art and Craft here in Portland, Oregon for 28 years. I taught ceramics and some other type of art classes, which was incredibly fulfilling. Um, I still make a, a, a variety of work. Um, for a long time in my career, I made both sculptural and functional work. Now I'm more focused on functional work, which is what our studio is set up for. And uh, I make uh, a variety of different functional dinner tableware um, pots for people to enjoy looking at as well as using in their daily lives. Um, this is some of my current work. I have currently I do three types of work. One is my what I call my mid-century modern, um, based on mid-century uh, era work and artists such as uh, Paul Klee, Jean Moreau, Vasily Kandinsky, um, Piet Mondrian. Um, I also do some. Earthenware, red clay, myolica work. This is uh, done with um, decals that are fired into the glaze and brushwork decoration uh, with numerous topics such as fishing, Audubon, biking, gardening. And I also do a line of just decorated um, earthenware, myolica um, tableware. This is the type of work I'll be demonstrating today. It's, and I'll be showing you how I do my line and color and composition work. Um, and I think, I think you'll really enjoy that as I do myself. You can uh, purchase my work in a variety of places here at our studio at 4614 Southeast Salmon Street. I also sell work in Lincoln City at a gallery called Mossy Creek Pottery. And you can also find my work on our website, www.janetbuskirk.com. Thank you very much. Here we are in the working lower part of our studio. And I will um, show you some of the materials and tools and talk a little bit about my philosophy of making, decorating, and um, creating. So... Um, what I'm going to do today is give you an insight demonstration on how um, I do what I call my line and composition work. So this is, again is an example of the type of work I'm going to be showing you, um, which has an incised line um, and then filled in color and then a clear glaze on top of it. This all happens to be Cone 10 uh, High Fire Porcelain fired in uh, our gas oxidation kiln. Um, one thing I want to say is I um, treat the vessel as a canvas and I think of it as a canvas that's in the round and that's the beauty, what I really enjoy about decorating on pots is that they have they're not a flat two-dimensional surface. There's an inside and outside to a bowl, um, inside, outside to a mug, and a mug and or a bowl such as this has 360 degree circumference. So it allows for various compositions to take place on one piece. So from that angle, you have one composition and then it changes somewhat. And it changes again, and it changes again, and it all links together. And then we have the inside also to work with. So I find that um, challenging and visually exciting when it's done. Um, 
Same thing like with a cup and saucer set. Not only do I have the cup and the saucer as independent decorated canvases again, but then I also think about how they're gonna link up together, how the patterns are gonna work with each other from the saucer to the cup. I tend to use primary colors. I like that kind of baseline that uh, primary colors are in our lives, both for children's toys, as well as for like um, signage in our world. Red, yellow, blue is kind of the baseline of all colors. All right, so um, the next thing I'll cover is some of my tools. One of my um, most important tools and maybe the first tool that I use is my sketchbook. Um, I think it's really important to try to work some things out on paper. So I always take a little time to sketch um, with pencil. It's a great way when I'm not in the studio to use my time creatively. Maybe it's in the morning with my first cup of coffee. Maybe it's when I'm on a camping trip sitting by the river um, where I work out some of my form ideas, some of my pattern ideas, some of my compositional kind of things. Often I also put color to them. So those are mugs, obviously. This is some ideas for plates. And here's some, you know, color work for some big platters. So I work out some. Do I follow those things exactly? No, but I use them as a strong reference point. Okay. Um, some of the other important tools that I'll be using is um, this. The way I, I do this is I use, um, I incise my lines into a greenware, like leather hard greenware, where the clay is, is about the consistency of cold hard butter. So an important tool um, that when I get to that point are um, very soft lead pencils. This is a, a 4B, this is a 6B pencil. Um, and what that allows me to do is to, to, to draw right on the clay if I need to. The next tool that's an important tool for me is a pin tool, but instead of a normal pin tool, what I do, if you can see on this piece of paper, there's a slight bend. I take a needle nose pliers and I put a little bend in it. And what that's for is that when I incise a line, it's not cutting a line, it's pushing a line and it tracks better. Instead of just the point of the pin tool being there, there's sort of like a little bit of like a, a sled runner and it follows and it's much easier to kind of like push a line into the clay. Um, I have some, these are uh, sew wheels for um, people who sew their pattern wheels to trace. It, it'll, it'll give me a dotted line such as this. So there's a lot of things you can just find for yourself another one of those tools that gives a dotted line. This one gives like a crimped zigzag line. And then I use various, um, these happen to be brass tubes that I've cut and sharpened one of the ends on it um, to impress, give me a nice tight little circle line on it. You can also find bigger things like this is a a plastic Easter egg and that can be pushed into the clay also um, or things like a compass to etch a line so you you can find out for yourself what works for you and there's things in your kitchen drawers there's things from the hardware store and such okay um, my lines after they've been incised um, are filled with a black underglaze and I'll go into that here shortly but the black underglaze that I use is called Easy Stroke 012 um, it has a the uh, Easy Strokes have a little bit more flux in them um, so they melt a little bit better 
I imagine the uh, Amico Velvet Underglazes would work also. This is just the one I like. It's a cobalt, called Cobalt Jet Black. I use that inside of a little tube liner squeegee that fills my line up and lays out a small amount at once. You'll see me do that in a minute here. Um, this is what it is called a fine line applicator, but numerous art stores sell them. They can be big ones like this or little ones like this. I especially like this one because it has a cap with a needle in it that keeps your little fine tube kind of clean of dried up material. That's my favorite. Okay. And then I use a variety of Amico Velvet underglazes. This is what gives me all the colors that are inside my line. So this is Velvet Bright Red, Amico Velvet Radiant Red, Yellow, Intense Yellow, Medium Blue. So that's my, my base primary color palette that I use. Sometimes I'll mix them together, like the radiance a little too orange for me, the bright isn't orange enough, I'll mix half and half, one third, two thirds or whatever to get the exact color I want. Same thing with the yellow. The medium blue is exactly the way I want it, just like a good intense primary blue. So now we're going to start working on, a, on a, the actual incising of the line on a greenware piece. Like I said before, I use my drawings as a, a starting point, or sometimes I've done a pattern or a decoration composition enough times I kind of have it down a little bit, although each one becomes its own entity. It's, I can never do the same thing twice. Um, this, this is a, a, a thrown porcelain piece that the handle's been put on, and it's rather stiff. It can no longer be deformed when I push on it. It's probably sort of a, it's not, it's not going bone dry yet, but it's pretty hard. Um, you can find, you just have to find your own wood place with how you and when you like to incise your line. If it's too soft, your pin tool will get pushed right through it and make too deep of a line. If it's too hard, it'll scratch a line, um, be kind of bur like a bird edge. So. Um, if it's too soft, you just wait a while. If it's too hard, you can take a spritzer and just give it a light spritzing and let that soak in a little bit and um, start off, off and the top will dry first. Okay, so here I'm going to just start with my specialized pin tool that has a little uh, edge in it. We'll bend it and I'm going to start working with the idea of the canvas pot as a canvas and work kind of in the round. And if you notice, I'm kind of using the tool, kind of pushing down on it. I'm not scraping it this way. The edge of the tool, the track, the track is laying flat so that it kind of pushes. It doesn't take any clay away. I'm going to switch over, grab my perforated wheel, and I'm going to try to think of there's one of my tubes that's been cut. I put the tape on one end so I always know what end is the end that's the sharpened end that's going to give me my mark. Let me just gently push that in. Gives me a nice place there.
I really enjoy throwing pots, um, but I would have to, will have to, I would say that decorating has always been one of my favorite, favorite parts of the process. Sometimes I think I'm just going to become a painter, but we'll see. So here's what I have so far. And there's a little bit of a burr edge there, but you'll see how I can uh, deal with that in a little bit here. And just like doing the brush work that I do, after a while you just get kind of confident, more and more confident with your tools and your mark making. Think about shapes and lines that will move a person's eye around the form. And also how color might interact with everything. So I'm going to stop there. Oh, one more thing. Oh, of course, there's always one more thing. I'm going to do something here, which brings a little bit to the inside. I like that idea of when you look across to the inside or down into a form, you find at least some little thing. These short tubes work really well for doing things on the inside because the long ones won't fit in there. So that would be finished. If there's anything to clean up, I might just use my finger and clean it up. If I make a mistake, sometimes I'll take uh, like a rubber rib and smooth it out, maybe put a little clay over it and smooth it out. That's sort of like the eraser in a sense. Um, but I just try to kind of except what I get sometimes. So now that would sit for maybe a week to dry um, and then it'll get bisque fired. Um, before I bisque fire it, I do a little bit of cleanup. Um, this is a piece that is the same clay. You can see the slight difference in the color. This is totally bone dry. This would no longer be able to have a line etched in it. But this is getting re this is ready to go in. It's dry enough to go into the bisque kiln. I'll take my rubber rib and I will take just go over all the line work with my rubber rib. And what that does, if there's any little burrs or anything that are sticking up, it gets rid of them. You can also sort of depending on your clay and how what you how you do this, you can also use like a little green scrubby pad and gen gently kind of go over everything. Sometimes I find the green scrubby pad makes a little bit of a, a grain in the stuff and then the stain kind of sticks in it. So I kind of go on to the rubber rib and just go over the whole thing like that and take away any burrs. And then boom, that'll go into the bisque kill now. This is cone 10 porcelain. I'll bisque this to zero four, and I find that that temperature allows um, enough porosity, but also the stain wipes away really, really well at, if this is at zero four. That's going to be determined by the clay body that you use. Um, at zero six, which I used to bisque to, a lot of the clay used to still be, I couldn't get the black out of it. Okay, so now I've bisqued my, my, my mug. This has come out of the bisque. I have 
Um, I take a compressor, I blow all the dust off of it. I take a very damp sponge, a slightly damp sponge, and wipe away any powder. It's really important to get any of the, the sanded clay away and out of your lines. So that's where blowing it out of there works really good. You can also take like a toothbrush or something and scrub it out. But it's important to get all that off of there. Then I will take my black underglaze. The black underglaze, as it comes straight from the jar, is, a, is really thick. It's almost the consistency of yogurt. So I mix it with water. I do like one, uh, one third underglaze to two thirds water. So one teaspoon of underglaze to two teaspoons of water. Shake it up, really make it, make, you know, mix it up. You'll have to just get a feel for this yourself. If it's too thick, um, you're wasting material and it doesn't go in your lines quite as well. And if it's too thin, it's not dense enough. So take my little squeegee. It's okay if it splooges. That's a very technical word, splooging. When I first started doing this, I used a brush and it took me forever. And then I found these things, these things work great. And I fill all this line in, all the way around the pot. Which takes a while and I'm going to just do one side of it here to kind of give you an example, and then I'll do my wipe away. Okay, so that kind of soaks in almost immediately, almost immediately dries. Try to be fairly economical about putting it in there so I don't waste material. Then I have a bucket of clean water. I have maybe a small sponge or a big wide sponge like this. And I quickly and vigorously wipe it down. And you want to try to rinse your sponge out in between. Press on it really hard so you kind of get it off the white areas and just leave it in the line. If your line is not deep enough, you'll wipe it right out. And if it's too deep, it's okay. my sponge wipe, 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 wipe. and you can kind of see there's still kind of a gray zone here and then a good old ceramics monthly had a tip one one month um, in the magazine about using these these um excuse me for a second mr clean magic erasers and these things work great so i take one of those you wet it, you wring it out, and for some reason, I don't know why, but it, it sometimes will pick up that last little bit out of the clay and, and give you a cleaner, whiter surface, which I like. So now your pot is sort of wet. It's not a good time to glaze or, or do any more decoration to it. Um, rather, I'd let this sit for probably 12 to 24 hours to really dry before I do any other decorating on it. Upon drying, this one's totally now dry. It's been sitting for 24 hours. Then I can start laying in my other colors into the designated areas. Because I have these little line kind of troughs that are in here, it's almost like cloisonne where your brush work when you fill these in there's a little ditch there that kind of helps you kind of maintain that nice tight edge and for this kind of work that's what i like so 
So here's my red that I have. This is a yellow. This is half of each one of these that I talked about before. And then I have my blue. I have a variety of brushes that I use because I have some shapes that are really small, thin shapes that I have to fill in, and other shapes that are bigger, bolder shapes that I have to fill in. So, use those different brushes. For, and same thing, sometimes I'll mix just a little bit of water with these. Sometimes I use them straight out of the jar. This is different than the wipe away. And sort of the like three coat kind of rule where you're putting it on. It's almost like you can't put it on too thick, but you want to get a nice, dense, solid color. Sometimes I'll just use one of the primary colors. So it's white, black, and red, or white, black, and yellow. Other times I'll use the combination of the three together. Sometimes I'll use pink or turquoise, but I mostly use my primary colors. Really load my brush up and then just kind of move it around in that little triangle there. Often I'll have a brush for each color. This one's way too thick, but I'll... Oops. That's all right. If you get it somewhere where you don't want it, you can take like an exacto knife and Make that terrible noise and scrape it away. That's your eraser. That works better than trying to get in there with a sponge. <laughs> so all this will get filled in with color. Upon being filled in with color, then I let it, it usually, this dries quickly. It usually dries within an hour. It's absorbed into the clay. I'll take the whole pot and I will dip it into a clear glaze that I have a large bucket or a bin of clear glaze, um, a cone 10 oxidation clear glaze. And that's what gives me this kind of nice, it's a little bit of an icy clear. It's kind of a cold blue, blue slightly blue clear. And then it, where it's over the underglaze, um, it goes on a little thinner. So there's a little bit of a texture change there. Um, which I don't mind at all, and it's just what happens. Um, these colors hold up really beautifully at cone 10. Um, they'll hold up at cone 6, cone 1. They hold up really beautifully on my myolica work also, which is cone 04, 03. So um, it's really fun working with color, pattern, line, composition, um, and uh, it keeps me busy. Thank you very much.